to the first of two uh, sessions focused on new research coming out of the Consortium for Scenario Planning. Uh, this session is going to be focused on scenario planning for climate resilience. Uh, my name is Patrick Welch. I'm a planner and policy analyst at the Lincoln Institute um, in our climate strategies team. I'm joined by uh, a truly excellent group of panelists, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, so I'm joined by Ryan Thomas, a PhD candidate in the Department of City and Regional Planning at Cornell, uh, Nick Rakovich, Associate Professor at the School of Architecture and Planning at the State University of New York at Buffalo, uh, Kelly Main, the Executive Director of Buy-in Community Planning, and Renan Almeida, Associate Professor in the Department of Economics at the Federal University of Sao Jao del Rey in Brazil. Now, before I turn it over to them, some really brief housekeeping. Um, the session is being recorded. Um, and unlike some of the other sessions that's more that are more presentation based, um, this one's going to be um, structured as a discussion. So that's going to rely on your engagement too. Uh, we'll have time at the end to answer any questions um, that you may have. And throughout the session, feel free to go ahead and throw those in the chat and we'll get to them at the end. Um, but also once we start the, the Q&A portion at the end, uh, you can also use the uh, raise hand feature um, and ask those verbally. Um, if you do that, we do ask that you turn on your video if possible, just to kind of um, help promote engagement and and not just speaking to a uh, to a black box on the screen. Um, and to give our panelists as much time as possible, we aren't going to have any kind of lengthy introductions or or presentations about their projects, but there is additional information on their projects available in the conference materials section of the uh, conference platform, Engage. Um, so the projects we're gonna be talking about today, um, they're all ongoing and represent four of the seven projects awarded last year as part of uh, the consortium's annual RFP process. Uh, this cycle broadly focused on scenario planning to advance uh, climate goals. And I know we're gonna discuss this more and um, I know it's been covered already in some of the earlier sessions, but at the Lincoln Institute, we really do see a lot of value in scenario planning to help planners, uh, the public decision makers grapple with, with all the uncertainties presented by climate change, um, not just changing weather patterns, but also what that means for a community's demographics and in migration and out migration, housing and equity, transportation systems and, and so forth. Um, scenario planning can be a really powerful tool to help consider all of these uncertainties in a, in a structured, uh, participatory, evidence-driven uh, uh, way. Um, so these four projects are looking at, at these issues kind of at different stages in the planning process and from slightly different angles, um, but I think there's gonna be a lot of common threads that will generate uh, a lot of really good discussion. Um, you have you know, you know, one project is observing an ongoing process uh, while another is kind of looking at best practices um, to incorporate scenario planning into the planning practice. Um, and then a couple of projects are looking at kind of the, the other end uh, of you know, potential solutions to, to deal with these impacts. Um, but uh, you were all in for a treat. Uh, all of these people are doing excellent work and it's been uh, a pleasure to work with them over the past uh, six, seven months um, and, and the teams that they're working with. Uh, uh, so with that, I'm gonna start with our first question. Uh, this question is for all of the panelists. Um, you can take uh, you know, three or five minutes to respond. Um, and we're gonna start with Ryan. Um, so Ryan, you know, take a minute to, to introduce yourself more um, if you'd like, and then to help everybody become a little bit more familiar with your project, uh, just tell us uh, what your project is, why you proposed it, and uh, the need you're trying to, to meet with it. Great, thanks, Patrick. So my name is Ryan Thomas. I'm a, a PhD candidate in city and regional planning at Cornell University. and uh, my research broadly looks at the, the uses of, of information about risk to inform climate adaptation um, decisions. And um, the project that I'm um, presenting today is um, it's called the Coastal Lakeshore Economy and Resiliency Initiative. 
um, I'm sorry, that's the project that I'm that I'm studying, which is um, in New York State. So all the counties along New York State's northern border with Lake Ontario um, are right now doing um, a collaborative uh, regional process to try and design solutions for increased uh, lake levels and uh, associated riverine flooding in that area. Um, so what I thought was really interesting about this project is that the region is so large um, with so many different jurisdictions um, that there was a lot of opportunity to understand more about how um, you know, uh, collaboration can happen through scenario planning. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm really looking at different ways that, um, that there have been sort of formal or informal um, uh, opportunities for collaboration and sort of emergent um, collaboration, collaborative processes. And uh, the other thing that's interesting about this project is that because there's um, such a large number of jurisdictions um, and the way the project is structured into five separate regions, there's some variation in the ways that scenarios are being used in the different regions. And so um, I use that as a kind of, um, analytically as a kind of natural experiment to see, well, how does, how do outputs vary if the scenario planning process itself varies? Um, and then just briefly, I'm not sure how I am on time, but the last question I think was how am I, what need am I trying to meet? Um, and I think that, um, uh, the, the need is really to move beyond jurisdictional regions as the sort of unit of uh, scenario planning and to, and to figure out ways to use, um, you know, risk and other sort of kind of environmental similarities across jurisdictions, um, uh, which requires collaboration. And so it's really trying to answer questions about how that can be done successfully. Thanks, Ryan. That was great. Um, now the same question for, for you, Nick. So, sounds good. So first, I just want to thank the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy for the opportunity to present this afternoon. Um, also want to acknowledge some additional support from Cuyahoga County Department of Sustainability uh, and my partner on the project, Terry Schwartz, who's at the Cleveland Urban Design Collaborative at Kent State University. Uh, the project that we're working on is a community-focused how-to guide for exploratory scenario planning for climate migration in the lower Great Lakes region. I hope everybody took notes on that and can repeat all of that back to me. While that is quite a bit of a mouthful, what we're trying to do with the project is, is look at cities like uh, Detroit, uh, Toledo, Cleveland, Erie, Buffalo, that all share an industrial history that drove economic growth in the 19th and 20th centuries but that has been followed by decades of depopulation and disinvestment. And as we look at the coastal regions and we see things like sea level rise and hurricanes and other natural disasters, the Great Lakes region has really been someplace that's been projected to be a climate haven in the future. And large part that has to do with the fact that we have access to a lot of fresh water and we also have uh, projections for moderate climate impacts. And so some places like Cuyahoga County in Northeast Ohio and also Western New York are looking at this as an economic development opportunity in the future. But there's still a lot of things at risk. We certainly have uh, changes in temperature and changes in precipitation that are damaging environmental systems and also our, our local infrastructure. And we also have a lot of social issues that have come from decades of disinvestment that still need to be addressed. But the need that we're trying to meet is really you know, looking at this at a 30,000 foot level you know, how do we begin to plan in the lower Great Lakes region for this type of climate change future? And while people are talking about a lot of people moving to the region, we don't think that that's something that's guaranteed to happen quickly or necessarily to actually um, drive enough population growth to overcome the outmigration that we've had for decades. Uh, in addition, while people talk about it being a good place for relatively um, mild climate impacts, we are tied to a lot of other regions in the country and could still have really severe outcomes. And so the scenario planning is a great way to look at some of those variables side by side and try to understand things beyond just the economic development perspective. What happens if we do have severe climate impacts or what happens if we don't see the population growth uh, that people are projecting in the future? And so bringing all of these things together and really incorporating the social and environmental piece as well uh, is something that we're we're really digging into as part of this project. So thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Nick. Uh, we'll move uh, to Kelly with the same question. All right, thanks. Thanks, Patrick. And I um, want to echo my thanks for Lincoln Institute's support for this work and also inspiration from some of the other projects that we've taken. Um, so my name is Kelly Main. I'm the Executive Director of Buy-in Community Planning, and we're a new organization that essentially is trying to improve the home buyout process for individuals and communities across the country. Um, we really take as a given that climate impacts are not only already happening and affecting communities, but are likely to intensify and developing more equitable solutions for helping communities who are faced with these irreversible climate impacts, particularly extreme precipitation and sea level rise, need better solutions and better tools and better strategies for adapting to this risk. And we really look at what we call our sort of holistic buyout processes, people, housing, and land. Who wants to move? Where will they go? And what happens to the land that gets left behind? And it's these questions, which are full of uncertainties, which in some ways brought us to, you know, maybe exploratory scenario planning is something that the, the communities we work in could use to help answer some of these questions about assisted relocation or voluntary property acquisitions. So this particular project is focused on the last question on land. Uh, what do we do with the land that's left behind? Exploratory scenario planning for end use of floodplain buyout parcels. And we're working with Department LLC, which is a great, um, really fantastic small landscape architecture firm who has done some work on adaptive reuse of, of buyout properties in southeastern Florida um, and also has some amazing research across the country. And what we're trying to do is more than anything, understand what kind of scenario planning exercises could be used by local governments who are faced with a variety of uncertainties in thinking about whether or not buyouts are an import, um, a viable strategy for them to implement in their communities. And so the proposal that we put together for this project was first to do a comprehensive analysis of the adaptive reuse of buyout parcels across the country. And I want to give a shout out to our, um, our intern, Victoria Woods, who's here on the call, who did an amazing survey of some really great processes for adaptive reuse. Um, and then to analyze uh, one particular buyout program, the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery's post-Hurricane Sandy buyouts as a case study for exploring how those buyout parcels were actually used by different municipalities and whether or not we could really untangle certainties and uncertainties in the context of planning for these parcels. Um, and from there, Maggie and Isaac, the, the folks from department, um, are working on developing some really fascinating design, conceptual design strategies based on the geological and hydrological characteristics of the parcels. So we really see this as kind of a, a preliminary exploration of the role of scenario planning. And we've got a lot of work to do, but it's been really fun to dig into this with, with Lincoln. I look forward to talking more about our challenges and opportunities with the rest of the panelists. Thank you, Kelly. And now Renan, on to you. Um, if you could answer the same question, just some, uh, you know, describe your project a little bit um, and the goals um, or the needs you were trying to meet with them. So our project is called using green and blue infrastructure for urban floods mitigations. And we propose it for several reasons. So we had some previous experience with the metropolitan planning since the university was hired a few years ago to make the metropolitan master plan here in the Belo Horizonte region. And Professor Emilio, who works together with me in this project, Previously, uh, research the use of green and blue infrastructure for one of the streams of the city. On my side, my last research estimated the land values across the city. Meanwhile, the city has just approved the new master plan in 2018, and Belo Horizonte faced the massive floods in 2020. So when we were in touch, uh, we were in touch for the call for proposals and then when it came we thought it was a really good opportunity for our topics and for our contacts it's worth to say that personally i have been in touch with the lincoln institute for many years through the latin american program 
guys like Martin Smoker, and I made a short session before the EAG in Washington, D.C. in 2019 with the participation of Anthony Flint. So there was a lot of interconnections. And we are really enjoying to make this research because uh, the results are quite interesting and there's from the academic point of view, a lot of potential for publications. And also there's some warning messages for the public policy. Great, thank you. Can I ask you just to describe a little bit more the uh the policy that, that Belo Horizonte was, was putting in place and... Um... Yeah, sure. So basically the city halls now offer a kind of waiver of land value extra charge for a additional high rise building. So if a developer wants to make a higher building than the basic uh, allowance in the law, they need to pay for it. Then, if they adopt some uh, green and blue infrastructure in that building, they might have a waiver for this extra charge. So the city is trying to incentivize an exchange between tax revenue and the adoption of like green roofs, extra rain barrels uh, beneath the building, or uh, uh, extra garden to collect the water the storm water and then to avoid a lot of storm water come together in the same time in the streams of the city. Great, thank you, Renan. And I, I already have a lot of different questions uh, for you all, so I look forward to, to digging uh, more into these projects. Um, I'm going to circle back to you, Ryan, um, and ask um, if, Ask another question. Um, you know, your your project is one of the only ones examining an ongoing process, and I was curious um, from your observations of this kind of multi-jurisdictional regional effort. You know, what are some of the strengths and limitations for scenario planning in this, and, and how that regional scale may impact that? Yeah. Well. Um... The, I mean, the strength of scenario planning from my perspective is that it allows um, a diversity of perspectives to, to be sort of maintained throughout the process without really driving towards, you know, one um, sort of ideal future or one, one plan, right? So it allows um, multiple jurisdictions that have different, different interests to be able to, um, you know, preserve, preserve those within the scope of a collaborative process. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when it's really done well, it has the opportunity to serve as a kind of platform for uh, for social learning, where people, where different, you know, jurisdictions and stakeholders can can talk about, um, you know, different values, not just sort of debate technical issues. Um, and, you know, I think one of the challenges is that as planners, we we um, often start sort of open-ended, but we're sort of have a tendency to drive towards um, single proposals. And, um, and I've seen some of that in the, the, my observations of the clear process, which hasn't quite finished um, their final proposals. Um, but um, one of, you know, th that's not that new. If you read the literature on scenario planning, that kind of dynamic is, um, you know, one of the perpetual challenges with getting the most out of scenario planning. And I think what, um, from my observation, what I would, what I would recommend, particularly in these kind of, this particular process, because it was um, really a state driven process it was organized by New York state. So it, it has a sort of top down structure and uh, the scenarios themselves um, were implemented or um, designed through a, a process by a number of consulting groups that um, worked with each of the five regions that I mentioned. Um, the way that those plans were organized um, was that they, they, there was sort of a, a brief list of guidelines 
that in terms of the, the required timeline, the sort of data that should be used in order to drive those, um, those processes. But the, the guidelines were focused um, on kind of those technical inputs, like I mentioned, the timeline, the data that should be used, um, how risk should be defined. Um, and so I think, I mean, my, my recommendation would be that in these kinds of processes where you have um, you know, a, an, uh, an umbrella agency where you could have sort of state directives would be to um, go beyond um, thinking of scenario planning as a kind of technical exercise and to think about ways to design a process that um, can, that by its very design um, puts different jurisdictions and different stakeholders um, on, a, on a sort of equal playing field where they can talk about values and not, you know, not just be focused on the technical aspects. Although I think as um, some of the other panels, particularly Renan's project, um, can demonstrate that scenario planning also, you know, obviously does have um, a lot of added value, even in a, a more of a technical, you know, when you're, when you're just looking at sort of modeling, there's, that, that's also a useful application of scenario planning. But in this particular instance, I think, um, you know, focusing a little more on sort of social and the process design um, could have improved the outcome and, and sort of uh, allowing scenario planning to achieve the, the, um, its potential. That's a good point that scenario planning is flexible, but the bounds for particular processes may need to be really context driven by the context. Um, uh, Nick, uh, I have a question for you. Um, okay. and, it, and it, I think it's very relevant uh, this morning in the keynote. Uh, one of the, the big trends for planners to watch for was climate migration. Um, and you know that's, that's exactly what uh, y'all's project is looking at. Um, you know, what's the value of scenario planning in this context? You, you touched on that a, a little bit, um, but if you could expand on that a little bit more. And I'm curious, I know your project is still ongoing, but, but the recommendations you're getting to, um, you know, how does that differ from what's currently being done in the region and how people are, are viewing, viewing this important trend to be on the lookout for? Sure. Um, so as, as Ryan just mentioned, I think there's a definitely a tendency in planning to drive towards one preferred scenario. And in the Great Lakes region around this issue, it is primarily that we're going to have mild climate impacts and we're going to have population growth. But even when you look at demographic models or climate models, there's really a pretty wide range of outcomes with, within those. You have some situations where population really doesn't even replace you know, the continued out migration. And in other cases, you know, you have a climate that's pretty close, like where I live in Buffalo to what it is now to something that more resembles, you know, Tennessee uh, in the future. And so, you know, thinking about all of those things across those axes, if you think about population gain and loss being on one axis, you know, and the severity of climate impacts being on the other axis, it really becomes something quite like a two by two matrix where you have things like condition of population gain with low climate impacts, another with population gain and high climate impacts, uh, third with continued population loss and low climate impacts, and the fourth, which is really kind of the worst case scenario of, of population loss and, and high climate impacts. Um, you know, if we're only planning and assuming that people are coming and that it's going to be a mild future, you know, we're not gonna capture all of those different possible scenarios uh, in our planning process. And I think more importantly, we're not going to be thinking through those issues to think about strategies that could actually work under each one of those different scenarios. And so, you know, the, the nature of climate models, the nature of demographic models is that it's a range, but if we can find things that work under, you know, all of those different ranges, you know, those are the things where we want to probably spend our time uh, and energy in terms of um, urban design or in terms of policies that we're trying to implement uh, for land use planning. I, I think one of the other things that's really important about the process is that we're forcing a discussion in some ways about unwanted scenarios. And so that can be really helpful for thinking through issues of climate surprises. You know, so for instance, you know, we could see uh, climate change impacts with changes in the jet stream right now that we don't currently anticipate, or 
things like the Great Lakes Compact, which protects the water in the Great Lakes region could be weak weakened over time. And both of those things would really change both the environmental aspects of it and also the economic drivers. And it's something that, you know, all of the cities in this region really need to start looking at. So, you know, that's why I, I think back to what Ryan said, this is really pushing us out of just preferred scenario planning into multiple scenario planning um, and having those conversations to think about what are the tools, what are the things we need to put in place um, to, to adaptively manage these things into the future. And are cities in the region or looking at, at those alternate scenarios? Right, right now, I think the preferred scenario is because we've been in, in decades of disinvestment is the economic development piece. It's to try to bring people in and it's try to advertise that we have a lot of fresh water. And while you know, I think that's helpful in terms of being, bringing resources to the region, it's, it's not guaranteed. And so you know, expanding that out, getting you know, economic developers to, to think through that, um, you know, and to connect with the communities and to develop plans that have buy-in, like all of those things can begin to emerge from an exploratory scenario planning process. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah. Um, Kelly, the next question is for you. Um, before I ask, I just want to say again to the audience that you can be entering uh, any questions that you have right now into the chat. You don't have to wait until the end. Um, but so Kelly, you know, it's interesting just hearing Nick talk about kind of receiving communities. Um, your project in a way is kind of looking at the other end of, of um, relocation um, and the, the land left behind. Um, and this can be, uh, you know, buyouts and um, can be a really uh, emotionally charged subject. You know, people have a very strong connection to, um, to where they live the land they live on and the, the home they live in. Um, so how can the end use of these properties help resolve this? Um, and what role does scenario planning, excuse me, scenario planning have in this? Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Um, well, that's a very complicated <laughs> topic. And I don't think um, scenario planning alone really gets at the root of place attachment and the importance of community. I'll just say, you know, as a really important foundational principle that we 100% only support voluntary property acquisitions. And so we're not by any means advocating, you know, well, we should come up with these grand scenarios for relocating large groups of people who don't want to move. But the struggle that we're really up against in some ways um, psychologically and fiscally, and I think institutionally, is that people see managed retreat or buyouts or sea level rise and chronic flooding as of the coastline or urban areas as fundamentally about loss. It's about the loss of place, it's about the loss of homes, it's about the loss of communities, it's about the loss of ecosystems and wetlands that we're losing to sea level rise. And I think one of the challenges that we're trying to uh, really dive into and, and tackle is what can we make out of this really painful reality into something which improves the lives of not just the people who are relocating and attempting to make them whole through the process of relocation, but also for the, the community that they're really making a sacrifice when they move away from. Um, and that it's not up to us, for example, as a supporting organization or the government, the local jurisdiction to decide what the end use of that parcel should be, but that the process of planning through these different scenarios um, can unlock some of those feelings of, of um, this is just going to be terrible for my community. And I think one of the things that we're trying to also better understand or that we're, we're taking as a starting point is that in most cases, and there's been some great research by a professor at um, University of North Texas, Elise Devar, on land use changes of floodplain buyout parcels from, her study was from 1990 to 2000. And most properties are um, just vacant land. And that's not necessarily a problem in and of itself. 
but there are a lot of reasons why municipalities and jurisdictions or communities are not able to actually transform that land into something that's more of an asset for the community. Some people think that these vacant properties are just blighted and abandoned. They actually decrease property values. And some people, if it's, for example, they have a side lot program, are saying, no, these side lot programs are actually great. They improve the value of my property. There's a lot of sort of conflicting information about whether or not buyouts in the long run actually help communities or don't help communities. And, and there's a lot of unknowns. So I'd say first and foremost, we're trying to really understand what are the strategies that planners in particular can use to communicate possible futures to address the psychological um, challenges that retreat really faces. Um, and that's why I think one of the things that maybe sets part of our project apart from some of the others and maybe um, meets with Anand's a bit more is the role of design in the creation of possible futures or alternatives that people can actually understand, right? Like if you're talking about, well, we could you know, build a park or we could um, restore this wetland, a lot of it can be very abstract. And I think it's been wonderful to meet, to work with our team and say, how do visuals um, help tell a story that can't otherwise be told through sort of policy and numbers that, that makes the challenge feel a little bit more uh, and the opportunity feel a bit more human. Um, so we're, we're still trying to figure it out as you might be able to tell it's, it's a challenging subject, but we're thankful for the opportunity to explore a bit more. Yeah, thank you, Kelly. Um, and Anand, I have uh, another question for you. Um, you know, thinking about this policy in, in Bell Horizonte that, that you're looking at, um, you know, there's kind of two uncertainties there you know one is um or the two uncertainties that that may influence the policy's effectiveness um one being redevelopment and and new construction that can take advantage of these and incorporate kind of new blue green infrastructure and then the other being you know climate and rainfall and precipitation patterns um you know to what extent do you think that the city there um, was kind of thinking about different scenarios um, and, and what lessons um, is, is your project kind of revealing for policymakers um, when trying to put together an effective policy? Okay, so I just learned a good expression about it. Uh, Nick just mentioned the unwanted scenario. I mean, when the city hall created the policy, they had in mind the very optimistic adoption of green infrastructure, but most of the people that design the policy, they have only very specific neighborhoods in mind. So when you look to the entire city, for example, low income areas, slums, high levels of informality, it's not clearly addressed in the way that the policy is designed. So uh, beyond that, we have not only two sources or two scenarios of uncertainty, all these needles and creates a wide, wide range of scenarios. So we are trying to simulate, so it's very data-driven approach, but we are also in connection with the local municipalities officers and we are making uh, uh, quarterly encounters with them to talk about the project, the results, their ideas, their impressions about it. And personally, I would like to expand this to get in, more in touch with the communities with low probabilities of renovation. So that will be probably like low income areas, slums, etc. So the first lesson I'd say that we have find is that the local government is in the right direction to try to give incentives to adapt for climate change. However, maybe it's not enough when you think of a city with this level of inequality. So it's probably going to work for high income neighborhoods 
but then you need to think about the other, let us say, 60% of the city. No, thank you. That's that's really interesting and, and definitely uncovers um, just the need to be really intentional with the, with um, with the policies and and avoid creating other kind of unintended consequences. Um, so we have about ten minutes left. I was going to pause and see if there's any questions um, from the audience that we can take now. Um, I see. Perfect, thank you, Tim. One just popped up in the chat um, and we can take that. Um, meanwhile, others can begin formulating their questions in the audience. Uh, Tim, do you just want to uh, ask verbally or? Yeah, I think it's, it, I mean, I put it in the chat, but I think it's something that's maybe more more sort of a discussion. So, I mean, you know, I've been in the scenario planning world for a long time from the sort of, you know, the good, bad, the bad and the ugly kind of normative scenario planning that a lot of us did, you know, 15 or, you know, 20 years ago when we talk about Envision Utah, you know, and obviously that had its limitations. Um, and it was about like, we can manifest the future, we just have to decide which one we want, right? And um, that's not, we know that's not true. Um, but at the same time, we're now in a space, like what Kelly was describing to me is normative scenario planning, right? And, and it's normative scenario planning with the benefit of design and communications and engagement, which we like, which are really important to it. But that's like a scenario planning that's used to describe a vision of what do we want? And if we're able to achieve that, how will we be able to manifest some of our values and not others or advance some interests and not others, right? And, and I guess to me, the role of normative scenario planning is really, really important in helping people reconcile conflicting values and interests that we can't, we can't achieve all of those. And what's really interesting about this is that these are great projects. Like I'm really impressed with all this. And like, I think this is really, this is really great to hear, but we're so much in the frame of like, well, there's a lot of uncertainty and we just have to deal with things that are coming out that somehow the discussion of the practice here is losing a sense of agency and the sense of challenging individuals to say, well, I can't have everything. Like, let's figure out how we would shape the future if we did have some control. And now let's look at how external forces may impact our ability to do that or change the landscape in the ground. And I think, I think there's a place for both, you know? And I, so I just wanted to bring that up because I, I, it's, it's not a critique of what anybody's doing here, but it's, it's just an observation about the way that we, the way that we, talk about scenario planning has changed so much. And our conception of it is now very, very much about ex exploratory and, um, and uncertainty and, and much less about the role of it in actually having people sort of examine sort of these, these, these conflicts and tensions that exist in, in what we all want. So I'd love to hear feedback on that from the panelists and other folks um, who, are, who are here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks to Ryan. It looks like you uh, have a response. Yeah, thanks for that comment. I, I don't have any, um, you know, tidy kind of answer for that. But um, one of the, just a quick point that you made me think of is one of the when I first started studying scenario planning, actually on a project that involved um, some folks from your group, I was um, really fixated on this issue, which I still do when I in, in this project is is to start by looking at what are the things that are outside of the control and what are the things that are within the control. So just sort of define the scope of the agency and, and to define scenarios with that very much explicitly part of it. Um, I mean, the project that I'm talking about here is a research project, so I'm not actually involved in designing the scenarios, but I still do that to see. So how are the planners thinking about what are the external um, forces that we need to contend with and what are the things that we could do and what's the relationship between those two things. I think to me that's one of the like it's a very simple framework but I think it helps to sort of address the issue that you're talking about. Kelly did you want to add anything? Yeah sure so I, I think that maybe what I would offer is that in, in some places normative 
planning for scenario planning for retreat where everyone's kind of agreed that we're going to do this thing and how we get there is maybe less certain. Um, there are other contexts and situations where, especially from a program or project management perspective, you are dealing with both critical certainties and critical uncertainties, which is, I think, why we're testing whether or not exploratory scenario planning might work or not. Um, and what we've been working with, um, with Maggie and Isaac, or department in particular, but which we're also interested in, is your geography, the place that you are and the qualities of the land, for example, that you're on, do provide a series of constraints. They serve as critical certainties when you're actually thinking about how you might best use or how you could best use the land afterwards. One example of that is whether you're dealing, for example, with stormwater or more of an inland flooding scenario, or you're talking about storm surge and you need, you're really looking at a coastal barrier. But uncertainties, for example, participation is like the key uncertainty in any buyout program, especially voluntary programs, because people can leave at any time. They can drop out at any point in the process. So that num the absolute number of people who participate, but also the contiguity of participation. Are you actually maybe going to achieve high rates of participation that are completely contiguous or high rates of participation that result in the checkerboard or Swiss cheese effect? And if you're actually trying to move people who want to move out of harm's way to enable them to retreat through these buyout programs rather than perpetuating a cycle of destruction and reconstruction by rebuilding in flood zones, then from a program management perspective, you need to start thinking about what your different cost options are, um, how this impacts your infrastructure, your other public services, its impact on your bank rolls and your property tax revenue, that these are all sort of uncertainties that we're trying to help program managers understand rather than saying the normative scenario that happens now is a planner or a program manager will say this area will get bought out and will accomplish everyone getting bought out of this particular area you know, with a particular goal in mind. So we're seeing if maybe the exploratory element can be a different way of approaching retreat that's a bit more, um, a little bit less organized <laughs> in some ways. Yeah, I think, I think that makes a ton of sense. And I uh, obviously, the, you know, the opt-in portion of it is a, the personal choice is a, but I guess I was, <clears throat> I was struck by sort of what you were saying about, you know, so many plots live, are just vacant and like is there a way that I guess when you're dealing with a situation of so much community loss right is there a way that you can use a, a sort of a normative or a scenario approach to actually try to create a positive vision for what that would look like recognizing that not everybody's going to buy into the program or what have you but that you can sort of you can create a sort of asset oriented vision out of that that also recognizes that not everybody in the community might want, you know, everybody in the community is not going to want the same thing. So, but I, I appreciate your, you know, the, the sort of further ex exploration of that. And, you know, again, not a critique of anybody's project at all. Like I more of an observation about the practice anyway. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. And unfortunately we are kind of running up against time. Um, there are a couple of, uh, at least two, probably more, uh, really great questions in the chat, but I, I don't think we necessarily have, have time uh, to cover those, but I will, um, you know, invite the panelists to, to respond to those questions in the chat if possible or, or reach out um, uh, to others. Yeah, thank you, Kelly, uh, to provide contact information for follow-ups. Um, but thank you all to the to the panelists and to the audience. This was a, a, tr a really great conversation. Um, I also encourage everyone to uh, to keep an eye on the Lincoln Institute website and the website of the Consortium for Scenario Planning um, for updates on on these projects and others and and other upcoming RFP uh, processes and, and opportunities. Um, I, I will also plug um, a session tomorrow. It's going to be a similar format, but looking at the other three projects as part of this process. Um, so please join us there um, to learn more. And, and thank you all again um, for your participation and, and especially uh, thankful to the panelists.